Hi, welcome to Authors at Google. I am thrilled today to be able to introduce Molly Katzen. I, I feel like I've met an old friend. I have my Moosewood cookbook from 19, about 1981. I was in grad school and one of my roommates uh, bought the cookbook and we started cooking out of it. And I had never been exposed to vegetarian food before. And it's absolutely delicious. And I have made the quiche recipe in this book so many times over the years, I can't even remember. I can't even count them. And so I am very, very excited. And Molly is here with her new latest cookbook. I don't know. How many, how many cookbooks have number you done? This is number 12. Oh, my library is a little depleted. I need to uh, stock up. <laughs> Hop on Amazon. No, no, I actually talked to Nadine. That's what I need to do. Uh, Heart of the Plate. And so please welcome Molly. Right, thank you. You said you'd be brief, and you didn't lie. Thanks for coming. It's so much fun to be here and people eating their lunch <laughs> while I'm talking about food. It's very homey. Um, I am thrilled to be here. Um, I've been enjoying talking about this, my 12th and last book. And I say my 12th and last book, and then people go, oh, and then I say, don't worry, because it follows by four years, my 11th and last book. And I, I started writing my last book in, in the, like 1988 or 89. So, and, but, but there's a reason for that. Every time I finish a cookbook, I feel that, that I, I couldn't possibly find something more to say. I feel like this, how, how many things can you say about eggplant? I've said 42 things about eggplant. Maybe there's 48 things to say about it. Um, but the knowledge keeps changing and the ingredients keep getting better, and the demographics and the willingness and the interest shifts around quite a bit. So there's always, it seems, more to say. Um, what I want to talk about, first of all, right out of the gate, since Dino, you kind of suggested that this would be a good uh, portal for the subject matter at hand, that, that the title of, of this book and the subtitle are, are two things that I, are worth um, looking into because they were not they were not simple decisions. The, uh, the, main, the main title of the book, The Heart of the Plate, um, doesn't say vegetarian recipes. It doesn't say how to not eat meat. You'll notice it just says the heart of the plate. And in fact, it's both a question and an answer. Um, the answer is threefold. Maybe it's fourfold, but at, the point, at this point, I'm thinking threefold. First of all, it, it reflects the fact, the kind of most literal fact that to eat a certain way based on plant foods um, taking up most of your plate is heart healthy, so there's the heart part of it, uh, that's your heart. And then there was the very personal memo I got from my editor on this book, who when she kind of launched me into it, when we finished our discussion of kind of outlining what it might be, she said, okay, I, am, I don't want to see you or hear from you for two years, write your heart. Goodbye. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there thinking, write my heart, what does that mean? And it evolved into writing what I love. So there's that romantic uh, interpretation of heart of the plate. And then there's also the plate itself. And what is at the heart of your plate? What is at the center of your plate? And that is where it becomes a question. What, what, are we, what is the model that we've grown up with, the model that lets us know we've eaten? There are so many psychological associations with what it means to have a plate of food that satisfies you. It's not just... Uh, eating cerebrally what I, what I think I should eat or eating sensually what I'm hungry for. It's also what you're hungry for emotionally. Uh, the plate of your childhood, which for many of us has a big hunk of meat at the center. And if vegetables appear there, they're mostly decorative or token or on the side, literally side dishes. But the main thing on this is the hunk at the center of the plate. I both question that in this book and also offer different arrangements for your plate, which we'll talk about in a minute. The, the secondary title um, is also a series of uh, semantic kind of queries and challenges. Vegetarian recipes for a new generation. I use the word vegetarian pretty much for the first time on the cover of any of my books. Um, it's not a word I, I like, and it's not a word for, for me. The, uh, the interpretation of that word is not simple. Um, what does vegetarian mean? I am not somebody who's against eating meat. In fact, I like a little bit of meat once in a while. And so here I am talking about a vegetarian book, and we go right to the subject of meat. In fact, for the most part, if you think about it, when people talk about vegetarian, when someone sits down at your table and says, I'm a vegetarian, they're, what they're mainly doing is making a statement about meat. As in, I don't want any. <laughs> As in, keep it off my plate. Um, in the 40 years 
in which I've been writing cookbooks, I have found that almost always the word vegetarian is that. It's about meat, as in keep it away. And also, I have found so many self-described vegetarians for whom it has nothing or very little to do with vegetables. It's mostly about the meat. So it's not as though someone says, I would like to stop eating meat, and therefore I am madly interested in Brussels sprouts. The stopping eating meat for whatever reasons, whether it's ethical or environmental or some combination or aesthetic, very often has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to be you know, chowing down on kale salads, which, by the way, I think were just invented in the last two years. <laughs> Something happened with kale. Um, we can explore. Um, so I use the word vegetarian because I choose, in, in the subtitle, in the secondary title, because I personally choose to redefine it. My definition of vegetarian has nothing to do with meat, except for the fact that in my perfect world, by the time we're all done putting as much beautiful plant food on this reconfigured plate as we want, there isn't much room for anything else. If there's room, it's, a, it's an incidental topping, which could be egg noodles, which is, in my book, a thin omelet sliced into, sliced into strips so that it looks like noodles, but it's really egg. Same thing with tofu, tofu noodles. If somebody wants a little bit of meat, but mostly vegetables, it could be a few strips of last night's steak left over, cut on top. But it's not a statement about meat, really. It's a state about what is the whole plate, and the plate is filled with plant food. So this leads me to my new vegetarian definition, which I hope you'll all agree with and adopt, which is I want vegetarian to become, in our vernacular, an adjective that describes the food on the plate and not a noun that identifies the person eating the food. Can we all repeat this? <laughs> repeat after me. Once we do that, once we take the word vegetarian and describe the food with it, instead of IDing the person with it, it becomes incredibly flexible, and it becomes, I hope, a big tent where everybody feels like they can sit down at the same table and eat the same basic meal. Whether they're adding that little you know, bit of strips of steak on top or the little bit of egg on top or not, this is a table where somebody who is a strict vegan, meaning, as you all probably know, no animal products whatsoever, no egg, in some cases no honey, nothing that has anything to do with animals, except for the kind of problematic fact that soil, good, healthy soil, is filled with little tiny microorganisms that are alive. Um, little fa <laughs> inconvenient fact. But other than that, it's basically it's completely independent of animals. The vegan can sit down at the table with the vegetarian who eats lacto ovo, as they say, with somebody who might have had steak for dinner last night and might have it again tomorrow night, but tonight wants the plant food. They can all share the same meal, and it's a big tent, one big table, everybody enjoying their plant food together. That's my dream situation. Very long way of saying that's basically the beginning part of my secondary title in the book. Ah, the se the, but I'm not finished yet with the title because the secondary part of the secondary title is <laughs> Vegetarian Recipes for a New Generation. I had somebody my age say to me, oh, but I want to cook from it too. Is it only for the young people? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, that's not what I meant by generation. Or is it? Then I realized, oh, multiple meanings once again. New, new generation, yes, people coming up, learning how to cook, young people who I, in, in my life, the young people have a far more open-hearted, embracing, um, kind of ecumenical sense of what food is. It's, it's, it's much narrow, less narrow than when I was coming up. At least those are the young people I know. But also, the new generation part refers personally to myself because I grew so much as a cook from the time I first published the Moosewood Cookbook until publishing The Heart of the Plate, almost 40 years in between. I became a much better cook and a much simpler cook. Uh, my cooking used to be very complicated, uh, at least to me. I uh, once, when I first started, once upon a time, I considered it very clever to put as many things in any given dish as you could find in your kitchen. I call it the kitchen sink school of cuisine. And so I would, I would be kind of breathlessly going through my kitchen and dumping everything I could into a single dish, always with sunflower seeds and soy sauce. And the, if, if eggs went in, they'd be beaten so it would hold together and come out in, in hopefully in squares or triangles, whatever shape you want. But it was a very like, kind of uh, complex, layered uh, sense of cuisine, if, if that's what you can generously call it. But now I will, put, I will keep it so simple that if, if just a, a splash of good olive oil will make something taste good and maybe a sprinkle of some designer salt, I'm thrilled. Old days, 
I thought it meant you were clever if you could put a lot of stuff in a dish. Nowadays, I don't feel like it's really about people thinking the cookbook author is clever so much as I really want people to get their dinner on the table. And I'm, I am your coach, and I really want you to be cooking at home, except for the fact that they feed you so well here. <laughs> I, was, I was having lunch here, and I was asking, is it OK to talk about cooking at home to people who work at Google and get all their meals? It is? I like the nod. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> And then there, there's one more piece to the definition of new generation, and that is, um, it's kind of romantic, bear with, the idea of regeneration in all of us, that we can all learn new skills and be opened up, even though we're very experienced, we can be opened up to new experiences in new ways of looking at cooking and food. If I have two goals, um, and I'd, I'd like to narrow it down, Neither one of them has to do, okay, three. Neither one of them has to do with getting people to eat less meat, although that is sort of embedded in my message. One of them is to get people to fall in love with plant food. Another one of them is to get people cooking at home, forgive me, Google. <laughs> um, cooking at home is a wonderful birthright to all human beings, cooking where we live, making our own food, and it's a skill that needs rescuing in our culture. So I'm part of that squad. And then the third goal is, and this is perfect because you're, you're divided into two sets of chairs, so you can kind of be the visual. We have in our culture a sense of dichotomy about food. So here's the firewall, this aisle. And on one side is food that's healthy and good for us, that we know we're supposed to be eating, and it's very depressing, and it's not very well seasoned. It's those spears of raw broccoli and zucchini from 1982 when you go to a cocktail party and you big big ones really raw like never cooked ever with an onion dip and everyone's standing around thinking ew <laughs> pretending they like it but it's it's the kind of un undercooked under seasoned under salted i call it remorse cuisine it's healthy and you will be miserable eating it but you will be ha you'll well, here's the, the paradox is you'll live supposedly longer, but you won't really want to. <laughs> It'll seem in, life will be longer, but it will seem interminable. And on the other side of this, but the dichotomy on the other side is food that's delicious and sensual and compelling, and we want it and we love it, but we'll pay later because it will be unhealthy or bad for us. And the, the adjectives that food writers, not me, use a lot for this is decadent or sinful. You've seen those in the restaurants or the kind of syndrome where the waiter brings one piece of chocolate cake for six of us with, four, with six forks, and, the, and the, everyone's going, <laughs> you know, this is like so we're being so evil. That kind of, but we're going to really enjoy this, but we're going to feel, you know, the, the syndrome is if it's really, really delicious, it can't possibly be healthy. So we straddle this division, and we struggle with it. Um, but long way of saying, one of my very biggest goals is to get rid of that division altogether. No firewall, move all your chairs in no aisle, except for fire safety in this building, and, um, and understand that food that is good for you and food that is delicious can be one and the same. Good for you, good tasting, just get rid of all of the other words and just use the word good and all the food can be delicious, and that's one of my goals. Um, one of the things that's made it so much easier to write vegetarian, slash plant food based cuisine is that ingredients have gotten so much better. Putting this into a, a cultural and historical context, 40 years ago when I started writing cookbooks, you could not find a bottle of really good olive oil in this country in any supermarket. You could barely find fresh vegetables. Bell peppers, for example, were always green and bitter. Red bell peppers did exist, but they were rare, they were expensive. If you found one, it was kind of a big deal, and you would have to call somebody <laughs> when you found a good red pe pepper, and you'd have to use it. You'd want to use it judiciously and not waste it. Things were so much more limited then. And also, and this is a mixed blessing because I, I, I'm kind of nostalgic for this, um, the fact that food really was local and seasonal because that was all you could get until very recently. It wasn't a thing to be local or to be seasonal, which it's, now it's become kind of chic. But it used to be what, what there was. Local food was the food that grew near you that you would get in season. I'm from upstate New York originally. I now live in the East Bay, which is 
so heavenly in terms of fresh. I, my East Coast friends are so envious because I just put in a bed of lettuce and it's, you know, beginning of December. We're very blessed to live here. When I first moved to the Bay Area the very first time uh, in, in the 70s, early 70s, when I was writing recipes, I would have to call my mother, who lived in upstate New York in the middle of winter, to see what was available there. And practically nothing was. I didn't want to write recipes only for people who lived in the Bay Area, although that would have been a whole lot easier. Um, so the idea that we can get most food, most places, most of the time is a very mixed blessing. But the, the, the good side of it is it makes it a lot more possible to write recipes that are very simple for very good produce a good deal of the time. There are, kind of, there are grains and legumes and different kinds of nuts, and not just good olive oil, but all sorts of good oils. No, oils made from roasted nuts are, are some of my favorites that you can drizzle on at the, at the end and, of your cooking and have it taste just berserkly good. Like just, it, yeah, I love that you're smiling. You've done that, haven't you? <laughs> you can tell. Um, so these, all, all this really, really good, um, this good selection of ingredients makes it so easy to cook simply. My idea now of a really good plant food uh, dinner is several different smaller things on the plate in some kind of a smaller arrangement. Rather than throwing everything all together, what you'll find a lot in the heart of the plate is a simple legume dish next to a simple grain dish. I call it a pilaf, although technically it's not, but just a little bit of a cooked grain, maybe mixed with another cooked grain, a drizzle of that nut oil, a matching nut toasted, sprinkled on top, done. Maybe a little parsley, maybe not. That next to a simple, again, olive oil, it's, it's my cooking crutch. People ask me how my cooking has changed. How do I characterize it? I say two words, <laughs> olive oil. Um, there might be a mashed vegetable. I'm so in love with mashed vegetables. I think I'm still reacting to those spears of the, of the raw broccoli from 30 years ago. So I've gone the, uh, the other direction, and now I cook it till it's really soft and run it through the pr food processor, thinking if not, why not, if mashed potatoes, why not mashed broccoli? I have mashed parsnip. I just recently discovered celery root. It looks really gnarly and unapproachable, but it, if you approach it, it's really very, it's like that big dog that looks <laughs> from a distance like there's a big dog. I'm afraid. You go up close and it's like wagging its tail. Um, not a good metaphor for a vegetable, but it's friendly in that way and sweet and you peel it easily and cook it up and mash it. But on top of the mashed vegetable, you can put a grilled vegetable that has crisp caramelized edges and play with the textures. You can garnish things with nuts and fruit. You can make the plate beautiful. Guess what? We just completely circumvented. We circumvented the hunk of something at the center of the plate because this is more of a collaboration rather than everything going into one dish with the sunflower seeds coming out in the squares. I've got a variety. Like a, it's almost I call it like a I love all the kind of metaphors, the collaboration. The plate looks like a mandala or maybe it looks like a constellation or maybe it's a bento box. When I do cooking with preschoolers in Berkeley, they say it looks like a peace sign. And when I do cooking classes with the kids in Marin, they say it looks like a Mercedes-Benz logo. <laughs> it's similar with the arrangement. I was actually, I was, I was um, showing this to one of my siblings who grew up with me in the late 1950s. And so he said, oh, it looks like the TV dinner with the little <laughs> sections, anything, however you want to see the metaphor. But it is a plate that's playful. It's a plate that's fresh. It isn't necessarily at all more work because every little component on the dish is really simple and it becomes a symphony. It becomes, as I said, a collaboration and it's really a lot of fun and I enjoy it greatly. You can also though, go the other direction and, and sort of, I hate the stealth uh, approach to vegetables, but in fact this is you can start to creep more vegetables into the dishes, the kind of comfort food classics that you might love like mac and cheese or lasagna, or even just plain cooked rice, start mixing some vegetables in to spruce it up and color it up. At a certain point, we get what I call the food flip, which is that where you started maybe with, oh, I don't know, vegetable fried rice, and you added so much vegetable matter to the rice that it kind of started to favor the vegetables. You go cross over, and it becomes rice fried vegetables because you flipped it in favor of the vegetables. Or with um, layered lasagnas, seasonal lasagnas, we're in late fall now, so in, in, I have four of them, one for each season, plus one with just every kind of mushroom you can possibly find. And a lasagna overwhelmed with mushrooms nobody will ever complain about. At this time of year, it's roasted butternut squash, layered with the noodles, but the squash outnumbers the noodles. 
So people, if people are saying they don't want to eat carbs, so you don't have to, you're eating, well, the vegetables have the, the perfect, glycemically perfect carbs. And there are roasted red onions, and there's ruby chard, and it's a lasagna. It is so much fun to do this. And I just want to say also in terms of food fads and food styles and what's trendy, and I, I'm often asked what's trendy, and I say, I have no idea. Would you like to just know what I just ate for lunch? Because that's my current trend. Um, one of the things I'm so grateful for is the end of certain trends that, that started, uh, I date some of them mostly to say back, again, the early 80s with those Rob Broccoli Spears. Um, I first published the the 10 speed press edition of the Moosewood Cookbook, which is the one that most people know, came out in 1977. Just a few years later, in the early 80s, in addition to the whole, the, you know, the raw vegetable kind of fad, suddenly everybody was talking about low fat being the ideal way to eat. And the, I don't know how this happened, but the low fat craze set in in the early 80s. And suddenly we could not, everything had to be steamed. It's part of, again, the remorse cuisine. And I just have to, I just have to share how painful it was for this cookbook author to be trying to come up with a recipe for potato latkes <laughs> during the low fat era. It was really depressing. It was so sad and they just, there was just no way you could make polite latkes. They have to be really rudely oily and crisp. Um, interestingly, if you were to graph the low fat trend in the 80s, the obesity epidemic mirrors it exactly. And those were the days when, so I would, I would make a beautiful chocolate chip cookie filled with real butter and offer it to somebody and they'd say, oh no, I cannot eat that because it has butter in it. And then they'd go to the store and buy an entire box of Nabisco snack wells, fat-free cookies and eat the entire box of cookies. This was the most irrational, thank you for going like this. You guys are so good. Um, when that, when that fad finally subsided, of course, it morphed into the low carb fat with the Ad Atkins one and the, when that, when, they, when all of that subsided, what we were left with was just real food. There is nothing more satisfying to me now than, to, again, that bottle of olive oil and being able to drizzle it on the vegetables and knowing it is like one of the healthiest things you could possibly do. Not only, this is such a great piece of news, it's a, it's a twofer or maybe a threefer not only does that olive oil make the food taste better and make the cook a whole lot happier, it also elevates the bioavailability of the beta carotenes and all of the phytonutrients in that green vegetable. So you're actually getting more out of it, you should know, by adding oil to the vegetable. So that, that part is all wonderful. So in fact, in this book, because olive oil is a so available now and so delicious and so high end and really affordable, um, when you when you think about it in context of the fact that you will now be eating a lot less meat, um, again, it's this is not against meat, but certainly when you eat less of it, you have more money for the olive oil and the nut oils, um, that cooking becomes simpler and it becomes more joyful. And what happens also is it becomes more creative. One of the things I hope people will do with these recipes is gain the confidence to follow them maybe once, and then to just decide, and this is what I tell you in the beginning of the book, it's my book until you buy it, <laughs> take it home, and then it's your book. They're my recipes while I'm testing them and I'm responsible for them working. Take them literally just once and then change them and make them your own. They're all very, very flexible. I've tried to keep them really simple. I know, for example, that if a recipe has too many ingredients in it, if that list, ingredient list in bold, if it's one or two ingredients too long, that you will likely turn the page and not, not make it. So I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. And in cases where there are a lot of things that you could add, because they were on my list, when I went into my kitchen to test this recipe, I thought I might end up adding X, Y, and Z in addition to A, B, C, D, but I didn't get to X, Y, and Z because at D or E, I took a taste and I was happy. And there was a part of me going, oh, I'd like to add all these other ingredients because it makes me look more clever and it makes the book look cooler and stuff. And I thought, you know what, there's somebody at home who's had whatever kind of day they've had, they have whatever kind of time constraint, they're in whatever kind of mood, and they need to get dinner on the table. I'm really thinking about you. And I want them to, at a glance, have a sense that this recipe is something that they can do. 
Um, and so I keep it simple. However, the part of my list that didn't make it into the basic recipe is on the next page under a heading called optional enhancements. And that's where I get to share what I might have done or what you might do to take it further and make it more complicated. But in the meantime, I've kept it as simple as I possibly can and as friendly as I possibly can. And so I hope that, um, I hope this will find you making friends with more vegetables, more grains, more legumes, more nuts, cooking all together and feeding people and making them happy. I also really hope that when you sit down with people, and this is another kind of, um, one of the reasons I question the word vegetarian, when you make this beautiful plant food, I hope that people sitting down at the table together who have different eating identities, say there's a vegan, a self-identified vegan, because I hate the labels myself, I really don't like them, somebody who identifies as a vegan and somebody who identifies as a vegetarian and somebody who has no clue and is just there for the food, um, that for at least the duration of the meal, we kind of leave all these differences behind and that nobody judges anybody else's mouthful and that everybody eats peacefully at the table. Because the last thing I want to do with the vegetarian and the vegan and all these different identities is add to the sense of otherizing other people over personal choices and habits through food. Food should be the one thing, and this is the preachy part of my talk, which I'll keep brief. It should be the one thing that, that brings us together. It should be the one, the table should be the place where whatever other divisions we feel, dis disagreements we feel, or the otherization of others that we feel can be left at the door. And for once, just for the duration of the meal, we can sit down and not feel those differences, but chow down together and enjoy the same food. Even if the person next to you puts that little leftover steak on top of their broccoli. So that's my hope for all of you and how you use this book. And now I open the floor <laughs> to your many questions, which I'm sure you'll have. Jen, what's your favorite brand of olive oil to keep around for general cooking? Because there are so many. I know, there's so many the brands. Even, I know, so many. Another benefit to living in California is that the olive oil options are greater here because there are so many boutique ones from, um, you know, I. I always look for dark bottles. Olive oil, similar to coffee, is sensitive to light, heat, air. Um, if you shop at Trader Joe's, the best one there is, in my opinion, the Greek Kalamata olive oil. Uh, it's the most flavorful. And then I buy boutique olive oils, or I actually get them sent to me a lot for tasting. Um, and the really, really um, fruity ones, the high, highest end ones, are great for finishing not necessarily for cooking. The smoke point for olive oil is pretty resistant, but th those really fruity ones. But I'd say my workhorse one is the one, is that Kalamata one from Trader Joe's. In between, when I, I use olive oil for most things, but when I'm not using olive oil, my other workhorse oil is grapeseed, which I, I love a lot. It's the green color is so beautiful. Good cookbook. How is it new? It's new because the publisher wanted the word new on there because okay. we stuck some. <laughs> I mean, there are some differences. There are some differences. To my old yeah, and this is lot. all going to change because in, in the fall of 2014, we're going to reissue the Moosewood Cookbook for one of its many anniversaries. This is the f w will be the 40th of my own self-published edition, and we we're going to kind of combine some of the old and new material. In 1992, on the when Moosewood was about 15-ish, because again, there were many editions. I went through the book and tested every recipe again. Um, just I wanted to see if I agreed with myself. <laughs> I wanted to see if um, how I would cook those recipes 15 years after, and hadn't been at the Moosewood restaurant for a long time, and just wanted to see. You know, I, I, I'd never made them all in a row. Going, I really actually went chronologically through the book, and I would glance at the recipes and then close the book and then kind of um, improvise and write down what I did and compare, and in many cases it was identical. Oh, cool. And in some cases it was not because I had a lot of extra butter and eggs that I, um, that I purposely put into the early recipes that I, I felt could come not necessarily completely out but could be reduced. So um, there are recipes, for example, the French onion soup, which I believe in the original one had eight tablespoons of butter for about six to eight servings. And I realized that it could taste just as good with only maybe three or four or, or two <laughs> tablespoons of butter. So it was trimmed down in that way. And then I added some new recipes. I took out some recipes I thought no one ever used. But then some people yelled at me because they had actually used them. 
I have a couple of questions. First of all, it's such a treat to have you here. And I, you. I recently moved to Berkeley. And so it's fun to know that you live there. Um, Monterey Market? Yes. Yes. Um, so my first question is if you could talk about protein rich vegetables or the kind of the protein content in vegetables. And then the second thing, I am having a chef over for dinner and I'm not as good of a cook as he is. And I'm wondering if there's any recipe that you particularly recommend mm. from your new cookbook. Oh boy. <laughs> what kind of chef? Any kind of specialty or nice person? I, I assume it's a nice person if you're yeah. inviting this person for dinner. <laughs> Very nice, open person. Well, um, so I'll start with the second one because it's easier for me to answer the second question. Um, I would guess that, um, wild guess, just out of the blue, most cooking professionals never get invited over to anyone's house for dinner or rarely do and will be grateful for anything you serve. <laughs> Just a little trade secret. Um, keep it very simple. Keep the ingredients really fresh. And if you if you have, I mean, this is pure, simple arithmetic. If X tastes delicious and Y tastes delicious and Z tastes delicious, and they are, it's not a crazy combination, but it's logical. They're going to taste delicious together. They're not going to lose traits as they blend. They'll it'll build, unless it's wild and crazy, in which case. Good luck. See, it, it might go well. But I would say keep it really simple and make sure the ingredients are top, uh, top of the line. And then, I mean, I, I love my mac and cheese recipes. One of my favorites is the one that has spinach and mushrooms. And um, the white sauce, which is made with white cheddar, is also made with beer. Uh, that's one of my favorites, personally. And then you can top it with toasted walnuts, which take it over, the, over into beyond land. I do not really know about the protein levels in vegetables. So I can't, I wish I could answer that, but I don't. I, um, I'm fortunate enough to have um, a, a bit of a pipeline to the researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health and Nutrition Department because they're my good friends. Um, and they usually keep me kind of informed about the latest nutritional findings, which is where the whole, I mean, they, I just owe them, we all owe them so much because they redeemed oil and fat so beautifully. Thank you. Um, but I don't really uh, understand um, the protein content of vegetables so much. I, I'm more old fashioned in that I recognize it more in legumes and whole grains and nuts. So I would love it if you find that out, if you'd let me know. Uh, thanks. So growing up Chinese, we eat rice with every meal. Um, so I've started to substitute the carb part with sweet, sweet potatoes or potatoes. Or, but beans and legumes and lentils are sort of my downfall. I don't know what to do with them. Why are they your downfall? I just don't know what to do with them. I didn't grow up with them. I just boil them and add salt, and that seems terrible. Why? <laughs> what kind of beans and legumes are you talking about? Just red beans, black beans. So I was wondering if you had any advice for just, I wanted to try a different carbs with, with dinner, mm -hmm. it's not rice and potatoes? Well, first of all, for beans, um, the kind that you buy dried and soak and then, and then cook after you soak them, they do age. So beans that have been sitting in some bin, either, whether in the store or in your house for two years or more, they will, they will be tougher and have less flavor. So even with dried beans, make sure they're relatively fresh. Same with dried herbs and spices too. They sit around, they, they all start to smell like white noise, <laughs> if white noise has a smell. So um, fresh dried, and then um, soak, and then, when, and then lose the soaking water and cook in fresh water. What I almost always do is I'll infuse that water as the beans are cooking. Garlic cloves, whole garlic cloves go in, uh, chunks of onion. Very fond of adding ginger, just big slices of ginger. Uh, if you can get fresh turmeric. Um, things like that, um, seasonings directly in. Sometimes um, when I'm going Italian style with white beans, one sprig of rosemary in with the garlic and the bean cooking water, well, they will infuse utterly. It'll just, it'll, they'll soak it right up and they'll retain that flavor. And then a good fruity olive oil if it's uh, Italian style. Um, if it is Asian style, a, a nut oil or a roasted seed oil, sesame or a pumpkin seed oil. Those oils are, um, they're volatile, they're precious in every way. They're precious in terms of being a little pricey and, again, unstable, but you keep them in the refrigerator and use them sparingly as a finishing. And that can help a lot too. D but you wanted to go beyond beans. Tofu, make tofu taste better. Um, I almost always, no matter how firm the tofu is to begin with, I simmer it in water 
before I do anything. I have a kind of um, water first, oil second, begin with water, finish with oil kind of manifesto. If, 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 if I could summarize a, in general, like cooking, like I, for example, like to blanch vegetables, it's a wonderful way to handle vegetable, what I call the vegetable volume challenge. You get home from the farmer's market or wherever you bought your produce, with, and you're, you're very well-meaning and bushy-tailed, and you want to get five a day, or actually it's more like nine to 11 a day now of vegetable servings. If you're serving a family of four, and you only can get to the grocery store or the produce market once a week, you have to come home with 120 servings worth of vegetables. And it's all well and good, but it's, they're huge. And we're, they don't fit anywhere. They don't fit, it's like they're, they're gonna go bad. So you get out your favorite big pot, by big I'm favoring wide over tall, get some water simmering and blanch everything. Give everything 10, 20, 30 seconds in the water. You don't even have to cut it. You can hold chard or kale by the stem and just hold it in, count to 10, take it out, wring out the water, let it cool. Uh, blanching vegetables ahead of time it will, once they're cool, and drained, their shelf life, I'm sorry, there's, there's, sorry, their shelf space will be cut by more than half. Their shelf life will be more than doubled. So they will last the week and they will take up a whole lot less space. And the third wonderful thing about doing this is that you've now created instant vegetables for later in the week because their shelf life has been so extended that all they need, and here it comes again, the olive oil. <laughs> Just a quick ride through some olive oil, maybe with some garlic and they're an instant vegetable for dinner, so that's nice. With tofu, I like to also blanch it. 10 minutes, it firms up so beautifully. Then you get, then part two oil. Part two oil with the vegetables, part two oil with the tofu. Then you can fry it up more crisply. Don't be afraid of high heat. And also, depending on your oil, uh, Spectrum Organics, I believe it's spectrumorganics.com, is a, a website that tells you the different it charts the different smoke points of different oils and how high you can take them temperature-wise uh, with keeping them stable. So it's, it's, a, it's a good frying guide, because frying does not have to be, if frying is done with the right oil and the right um, temperature, um, it can be very clean and it doesn't end up being greasy. So tofu that has been simmered first, or tempeh, uh, which is an inoculated uh, soy product kind of fermented, um, then they go into the hot oil and you get them really crisp and then you have the whole texture thing going on and then that should do it for you, I hope. But using oil in the right way makes a huge difference, and using heat in the right way. Hi, I have a question regarding your favorite olive oil. Uh, there's been sort of conflicting information around it, and you know the title of your book has the word heart in it. Um, one of the heart experts, Dr. Esselstyn, he's been an advocate of not using oils. So I was wondering if you have any insights around that, especially given your pipeline into Harvard nutri Nutrition. You mean about a, a low oil diet? Yes. In, in fact, you know, there are people who say no oil diet, but you know, olive oil, a lot of that. Um, do you have any insights as to whether there's good research about? Um, I, I have to qualify first by saying I'm not a nutrition researcher, nor am I um, a dietitian. So I just kind of pilfer information from those who are. <laughs> um, it's my understanding that uh, oil is very heart healthy, that olive oil is a heart healthy, that, that you should go out of your way to include it in your diet because it is in fact um, a heart protector. And that nuts also, not even just nut oils, but nuts, avocados, those ki kinds of oils are very, very healthful. Um, and I believe and I will check with him, but I am pretty sure that Dr. Walter Willett of the Harvard School of Public Health, who's the head of their nutrition department, is up to a good, probably 30% or more of the calories per day that he would like you to get from olive oil alone. It's, it, it's, the model is called the Mediterranean diet. Um, and it also includes fatty fish. It also includes um, one or two drinks a day of alcohol. Yeah, so for, for people who like alcohol, that's kind of a nice thing. So th for for the people I know and the people who school me and these things, I would say that I'm very pro-healthy oil, but anti-unhealthy oil. <laughs> but it's a question of the quality of, of the oil. It's not all fat is bad, but look for the good oils. In fact, it really makes no sense, according to these researchers, and I am totally convinced by them, to when you see those labels on food and they tell you calories from oil, percentage 
oil, grams of fat, meaningless. It doesn't, what does that say? What, is, what, do, what do you take home from that? Um, it's all about quantities of fat which don't mean anything. Um, there, it's not a different kind of calorie. Um, it's not necessarily bad or good. If you have to look further and see what is, the, what is the actual source of fat. But it is my understanding that a good oil is a very healthful thing. The, the expression, the phrase, essential fatty acids. The word essential is literal. Those are fatty acids that your body needs, that your body cannot manufacture. So you need to take it in. You need to ingest it. Quick question on uh, pots and pans that are used in cooking. Uh, is there a difference between, say, cooking in a nonstick uh, pot or pan versus, say, uh, an iron skillet? Because I've been led to believe that they do make a difference in the flavor of the food. What's your experience? What kind of difference do they make? Well, I, I just want to know. I don't cook much. I just hear about it, and mm -hmm. I'm planning to buy some pots mm -hmm. and pans. So I thought your feedback yeah, would be I, I, um, I do have an uh, opinion on it, just the way I feel about cooking and the way a pot, pot or pan feels to me. Um, I want it to be as heavy as possible. And I go for horizontal cooking as much as I can. It's interesting, that's one of the things, I could give a whole other talk about how my cooking has changed and one of, them, one of the ways is the shape of my cooking used to be more vertical and now it's more horizontal. Horizontal meaning that um, every tidbit in the pan gets its own place in the sun, so to speak. Contact with the surface, with the heating surface is, is in itself a way of flavor being imparted because that, that cooking surface um, depending on its proximity to the heat and the intensity of the heat and the kind of oil, um, is itself a, f a seasoning. It's a f it's a at that point, that's the point where you can actually hear the sound when you hear the sizzle of a tidbit going into the pan. You're hearing the imparting of flavor. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't like nonstick pans because I su I'm suspicious of the materials used in the coating, which can leach into the food and they're chemical and they're not necessarily he healthful. I they can in fact be unhealthful. This isn't completely, <laughs> I was say not, it's not ironclad, but it's, um, <laughs> it is pretty much the rule of thumb is I would avoid coatings. So I like heavy, I love cast iron, and it's also the least expensive. And for me, it's the most nostalgia inducing because it's what I, you know, it was the first cookware I ever had was cast iron. Um, and it's, it's a very honest cookware. And I like the fact that you can heat it really well and slowly. I'd much rather have a pan that's been heated on a medium low flame for a longer period of time than flashing something with a sudden burst. Um, so I would go with something that's, that's like anodized steel is a really nice, heavy uh, kind of cookware, which I like a lot, and then the cast iron. But avoid anything that's very lightweight, literally lightweight, and, and that is coated. Um, one way you can have non-stick, a non-stick situation without it being officially non-stick is if you're patient with the heating of the pan and make sure it gets very, very hot and then add your oil and then make sure the oil itself gets very hot so that when you, when the food finally goes in, you hear the sizzle again. The hearing the sizzle tells you that it's probably not going to stick. And then you have a metal spatula with which you scrape the food as it cooks and you shake it, keep it going to keep it from sticking, you're the non-stick factor. Your cooking habit becomes the non-stick factor. Uh, I used, my recipes used to say, oh, just cook the vegetable or heat the pan. Didn't even say heat the pan, it said put the pan, on. I don't remember what I said, but now I very specifically almost always have one clear instruction first, pan on heat. Wait. Oil goes in, wait. Swirl to coat, wait. There's a lot of waiting. It's like a time signature in music. There's a little rest. And then the food goes in and you hear the sound of it being infused with flavor and with it becoming something that's not going to stick. Would that help? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so you call it recipes for a new generation. And I'm thinking of my son who used to read pretend soup at night in bed, picking out the recipe he wanted to cook in the morning. And who asked, as soon as he saw that you had a new cookbook out, said, this is the book I want, the heart of the plate in my new apartment. This is my cookbook to cook Great. from. So he grew up thinking of you as a model, which I think is wonderful. And you say this is your last cookbook. So what about your last children's cookbook? Are you doing more children's cookbooks? That's really possible. See, I have no credibility <laughs> when I say this. Um, pretend Soup and Salad People are the two cookbooks I wrote for preschoolers. 
um, it, there's there's sort of a reading readiness embedded, like early, early, early reading recognition of numerals and certain letters. Um, it was very hard to find things that preschoolers could or would do, because just their little arms and things, you know, can they, for example, everyone thinks, oh, preschoolers will make cookies. <laughs> nuh because they can't stir cookie dough. And you don't want to be doing it for them. Um, and then I wrote one later, Honest Pretzels for Older Kids, with, which was difficult because it's, it's the level is, is so all over the map that some kids have a lot of experience cooking, some don't. Um, I think there's a lot more to do with kids. And um, there's certainly a need. And I love hanging out with kids. So there's a good chance. Was that the whole question, darling? Because she's my friend. <laughs> that was it? But um, shall we talk? Cause I love cooking. I think kids are just so fresh and so honest about food. And, and one of the things that's been so wonderful about cooking with children is um, they're so not what you expect in the kitchen. I'm saying, you know, I'm, sp I'm speaking in a very broad generalization, but the idea that they're being invited into what is normally considered an adult realm, they're so honored, and we expect them to want to make a mess. And what I have found is when they make a mess, they get very upset um, and want to clean it up right away, and they really want to make something that they can feed you. And it's a wonderful way to um, elevate a child's feeling of being effective. So, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> it'll be, yay, it'll be fun. <laughs> I, I, I thought of something I didn't say earlier that's an important point for me. Um, when you asked me about the materials, about the pans, one of the things that um, is important for people who are new to cooking a, a lot of vegetables and you know, really cooking vegetables. I mean, I grew up with frozen vegetables. In my mom's house, it was frozen, and I actually loved them. And my first vegetable dish that I ever cooked was opening up a package, and it was green beans. And most of the instructions when I was trying to write my early recipe was had a lot to do with opening the package. <laughs> first, you go to one end and you open, you tear it, and then if it doesn't open, you take a little knife and cut it open. And but it was all about getting it out of the package. <laughs> and then you add water and put it on heat. And then when the corners fall off and it's no longer square, serve. That was my early one. But now it's about the knife. Now it's about you get the fresh vegetables home. And for a, a lot of people, I believe the barrier to cooking more vegetables is a little bit of uneasiness about the knife, which is a very essential thing. I call it the knife block. And it's so, again, we talk you know, about the, the, the line in the sand before and after. There is before you bond with your knife, and then there's post bonding with your knife. It's a whole different world. When you find the knife of your dreams, it's like, a, it's a, it's like finding a relationship. And it's, there's no one knife that's right for everyone, but there is a knife that's right for you. And it feels good in your hand, and it's got a, a straight blade. It can be a six, eight, 10 inch blade. But it feels good to you, and you keep it very, very, very sharp. You have it professionally sharpened once or twice a year. And it is so exciting to try to cut something with a sharp knife for the first time. It heads toward an onion or an apple, and with almost no pressure from you, it grabs in. It's a clean slice. Maybe there's an, I, I'm so into side of, um, sound effects. Did you hear this little whoosh? Like whoosh? And lo and behold, you have a clean perfect slice of onion or apple, and you then have religion. And then you, not only, then you've crossed over in a good way to the good side, and that's when you not only are willing to cut onions, you cut, you, you cut onions for all your friends, and you will look for things to cut. You, th when you fall in love with slicing stuff, everything changes. And I just had my knife sharpened, so I'm in a really good mood about this. It's like, I, it, it, it just brightens your life. You go for the small things. Enjoy that, because that will really change your cooking life. I, I guarantee it. So always this time of year when there's the, just that first chill in the air, I make that lentil soup out of the Moosewood cookbook, and it, it warms my heart. Aww. But <laughs> uh, from, uh, from your descriptions, it sounds like you're constantly jumping from recipe to recipe, or you're making a lot of different things, trying out new things. How do you balance between making something new and going back to old favorites? That is such a good question. I'm, I'm wondering why I've never been asked that before. You're so ori original. Um, I test a lot of new recipes. Obviously, when I'm working on a cookbook, I'm not always working on a cookbook. Um, and in between um, cookbook you know, projects, which take several years, because those recipes, these, I've tested three, four, five times. Um, 
And I actually lose sleep over the ones I think aren't coming out very, I really care. <laughs> I really care. Um, w when I take off my cooking, making a cookbook hat and I'm just an ordinary citizen, I am pretty much incapable of following a recipe. I've tried and I, it's hard. It's a rebellious thing, I don't know what it is. Um, and I cook very much by going to the market and seeing what's there and what just speaks to me on that day. Um, that said, I do have a few favorites. If I can kind of, I can't really follow even my own recipes, but that lentil soup is one that I will just, when I have, n have nothing else going on, I just, start, I just automatically will put lentils on the stove and start making that. Um, I cook really simply and um, it's, be it's like being on vacation to not write things down because it is, you know, a cookbook is a technical manual. It really has to work. And also in writing one, you don't really know exactly whom you're writing it for. Who, what's your habit? What's your habit? What do you need me to tell you? How comfortable are you filling in the blanks on your own? What does your kitchen look like? What is your attention span? What, what are your taste buds? I'm guessing. Um, not to complain, but it's really fun when I'm not having to do that and when I'm just cooking and I don't write it down. On the other hand, if I don't write it down and then I really liked what I made, I can't remember what I did, but I don't, I pretty much don't cook the same thing more than once ever in, in real life. I hope that was not too disappointing because it's really true. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Thanks, Molly. Diana. That was Thanks awesome. Thank you so much. So if you'd like to get your book autographed.